Jesus, uh, for being immature, stupid, childish, uh, you, you know, and, and often ridiculous. This was a movie that showed that you could have a character named Professor Poopy Pants and play it out very well, not just for cheap laughs, but for a lot of good, a uh, lot of good humor and a lot of good heart. And it's theme song written by Weird Al Yankovic. It's Sleepless with Steve and the Movie Book Club with your host, Steve Pulaski. Office. We're going to get into that next hour. We got more important business to talk about. It is our top five films of the summer. Very much looking forward to this. Told you to make a list last week, Dominic. You happily obliged and whatnot. Uh, so we'll get into it. We'll give our uh, give your number five pick. I'll let you start. You give your number five pick of your favorite films from May from May to September. First uh, summer movie that kicked it off was Guardians. Guardians, Guardians two. two. Yes. Yeah, that, so we'll mark that as the official May start. May sixth. Yes. Because I'll tell you right now, if Get Out had been after Guardians had released out after Guardians, that would have been like. Number two, at least, if not number one. But it, regardless, we can't put Get Out in here. But uh, number five pick for the summer was Logan Lucky. Good we, one. Th- there may be a slight bias there because I, I had seen it uh, just a week ago. But uh, what I really loved about Logan Lucky is because how compared to everything else that the summer was either franchise or heavy, um, Logan Lucky came in and it it's just there. And, and, but entertaining. I don't mean it in a bad way. It doesn't It, it doesn't aspire to be more. It's just a film where everyone is looks like they're having fun. Clearly, they are having fun. So, as in any Soderbergh movie, uh, Steven Soderbergh directed movie, the cast is what shines the most in Logan Lucky. It's it's essentially just Ocean's Fourteen set in West Virginia with more relatable characters, and I have no issue with that. And uh, Channing Tatum makes a actually pretty good you know protagonist as the center of this movie. He centers the movie very well. And Adam Driver, Daniel Craig make hilarious kind of turns in this movie daniel craig for sure but adam adam driver is kind of the understated performance here because he he captures that we had talked about it earlier in the in the review but he captures that mopiness and mooniness but not dumb yes but he captures introverted that introverted and he just plays deadpan the whole movie and he's kind of the epitome of that soderbergh style of deadpan because um like in the like in the oceans movies logan lucky captures that uh deadpan humor where it's like there, there's hardly any laugh out well, i shouldn't say that but it everything is just kind of played it played it straight and i i, I enjoyed it immensely there's a and, lot there's a lot of good wit in that movie mm-hmm. and i mean we talked about that pretty extensively last week on the show i liked it a lot if this had been the top six logan lucky would be my number six so i'll let yeah, you know it's not my sure. top five but i liked it i did like it a lot i thought it was a welcome return for steven soderbergh now this one might be a little bit a, cheap. a return or welcome, return, welcome quote, back, unquote, return after for, like a year yeah for about th- for about two years i would say right he didn't really go anywhere because he did an hbo show i will say that it is um it, it is more or less a return to movies because he was hung up on TV mm-hmm. for a few years and stuff like that. So anyway, moving on with my number five pick. This might be a little bit unfair because, I mean, I do see more movies than you. You did not see this one. I think we should have. I, I wish we could have talked about this on air. My number five pick is Captain Underpants, the first epic movie. Came out early June alongside Wonder Woman. A lot of people, I think, forgot about this one. I think a lot of people either saw it. It got really good reviews. Very strong reviews views very well received came off was a very safe bet too for dreamworks this was one of the i think the cheapest dreamworks animated movie it was only it only cost 38 million to make so there was a good potential for a high profit margin and it did fairly well but it was also coming off the big time grocer the boss baby this year Mm. so it had that safety net you know what i mean if movies like like okay can you put up with cars 3 if it means getting coco later in the year you know what i mean or something like that can you deal with transformers which means that we'll get a movie like detroit you know what i'm saying like it kind of even evens that out. So Captain Underpants as of somebody who's a fan, who's a big fan of the book series by Dave Pelkey, uh, back when I was a kid, probably explains a lot now why I'm kind of, you know, kind of, kind of a moron <laughs> now in a lot of sense. But as somebody who's coming from a diehard fan of the book series, this movie did everything that it could to live up, even though I still believe it was too, in a way, it was too, it was too late. It, I think if this movie had come out ten. 15 years ago. Yes. Well, this would have been huge. 
Huge would have Y. It would have been a big movie. But the problem with it was that it's come at a time now where I still think kids read Captain Underpants, but I don't think it gets the same kind of like passed around elementary school. I don't have siblings, so I can't vouch. I can't confirm what I'm saying. It sounds like the majority. I, I, I should I should say I did not see this movie, but it, I, I did see the good reviews. It sounds like this movie was marketed towards more of a in more of a nostalgic sense. Yes. To, to people who grew up with the with the books, Even as, the a, cast. as opposed to kids who are growing up with them now. Even the cast, you have the writer Nicholas Stoller who wrote Neighbors. Mm -hmm. You have Kevin Hart, Ed Helms, Thomas Middleditch, Nick Kroll, Jordan Peele as your cast. So you have a very like a cast that's very much ingrained with like more adult comedies and stuff like that. So this really did market well, I think, to people of my age. But I was having a great time. The animation in this movie is very cool. It's got like these cool understated blues and these characters occupy the kind of cylindricality that they had in the book and it's in the in the book series and it also proves and this is the big thing and then I will move on from this but it, the big thing that I liked about Captain Underpants the first epic movie is that it was a movie that could be immature but be funny and be immature I always harp on the Diary of a Wimpy Kid franchise I think it's one of the worst franchises in many moons uh, for being immature stupid childish uh, you, you know, and, and often ridiculous. This was a movie that showed that you could have a character named Professor Poopy Pants and play it out very well, not just for cheap laughs, but for a lot of good, a uh, lot of good humor and a lot of good heart. And its theme song written by Weird Al Yankovic. So, oh, okay, there you go. It set the mood right from the start. I enjoyed the hell out of Captain Underpants, the first epic movie. It sounds like a clever, like actually smartly handled script. I highly recommend it. It comes out to DVD in a few weeks. One thing that um, bothered me from the trailer, again, I didn't see it, but one thing that bothered me from the trailer was um, Kevin Hart as yes. one of the kids in George, the movie. George, yes. And, it's, and it got me thinking... That's a little. That sounds a little distracting because that does not sound like what a kid should sound like. I thought so too, and I was worried because Kevin Hart's one of those guys. Like you can't forget it's Kevin Hart. Oh, it's so yeah. But yeah. you know what? He worked in this movie very well. Ed Helms does great as Captain Underpants. Thomas Middleditch as Harold. George. This was a very two main boys in the movie. Uh, they do extremely well. I mean, okay. this was a very well for somebody who is skeptical as all get out. This was a very well uh, acted film in terms of the voice. So Captain Underpants, the first epic movie, my pick, my number five pick for the mm -hmm. top five favorites of the summer again these aren't best i hate to use the b word on that i hate to use the word best like i try i've changed my ways with making my end of the year list i don't say top 10 best movies i say top 10 favorite movies i use the f word instead of the b word <laughs> you know I, I, the ones it, you can't say on air yeah indeed indeed so we'll go so we'll go dominic your four number four and number three pick but don't skip on the details gotcha so number four i had atomic blonde starring charlie's Theron, my number four, because... Which we did not talk about on air. We, did, we did not talk, talk about, about on air, air. so that, that one is the exception. However, um, what, what really caught me about this movie was its style and aesthetic, which is really in your face, but not in a way uh, that's kind of, uh, that's, that's over the top. It's, it actually works, weaves itself very well into this movie with a lot of, and it brings out a lot of attitude. And uh, the style and aesthetic there, it was so distinct and not regurgitated. And I thought... It had a style that was better than Baby Driver. I'll tell you right now, Baby Driver does not make a list on this top five. I'm surprised to hear you say that. That, that you say that you said it was better than uh, that better style. I, sh than I Baby. should say, yeah, better stylistically. Style. Stylistically, I think it's better than Baby Driver, and I think that's what propels it into the list, as opposed to the uh, editing overall. I don't, I don't even know if it's a better movie than Baby Driver, but I thought it just felt different. I thought with Baby Driver, now we're kind of, I'm kind of comparing that, but still, I thought with Baby Driver, it. It was, it was, I thought it was a great movie. However, I thought it had a style that was kind of, oh, for me, almost forgettable because there was so much emphasis on the editing, which is not a bad thing, but. Which it, is Oscar worthy in itself, uh, I'd absolutely. argue. I was going to say, Baby Driver is going to win an Oscar in something. Most likely the I editing. I hope you're right. I was about to I say. I hope you're right. And it meshes so well, but the editing is almost. For me, as someone who watches enough films to recognize this stuff, I thought Baby Driver was edited so heavily, not poorly, but heavily, that it uh, it almost distracted everything else in that movie. Because that's that's like the one, the number one thing I remember from that movie. Mm -hmm. Whereas Atomic Blonde, it had multiple things going for it, like like I said, style and aesthetic. And I thought its fight scenes were spectacular. I loved how they handled Charlize Theron's ability to fight in this movie because she's not just throwing dudes willy nilly like she's like she's a superhero. No, she is. She's actually using physics in a realistic way because I I saw a lot of stuff online how like 
uh, MMA fighters were analyzing how Charlie Theron was taking on the bad guys in this movie. And uh, they noted that she's actually using the people she fights in this movie, their, their weight against themselves. Really? And like throwing them or like uh, using rolls and stuff to actually like flip people over and using the environment in very clever ways. And it, it, I, I really appreciate that. As someone who grew up on a lot of Jackie Chan movies, uh, who I'm sure will not make any any list this year. I don't know how those movies are going to turn out, but um, I really enjoyed Atomic Blonde. I did give it marks, though, for its convoluted plot, its ridiculous plot, yeah. to, and which deviated from the graphic novel to the point where, like, hey, let's let's be clever in terms of how many holes and red herrings can we give you? That way, it's it's totally original to the point where it's like, just like a lo- like like a like a loquacious first date. I don't care if you're a man or a woman, uh-huh. what your orientation is. Like a lo- loquacious first date, it's best when it shuts up. You exactly, know, that, that's really what I uh-huh. said. About that applies line. to any date. Yeah, that's any person. <laughs> and also the character motivations here. They were cool characters, but their motivations were all over the place, and it kind of goes hand in hand with that plot. McAvoy's you, great in that movie. McAvoy's yeah. great, but his motivation is like, what? What is happening here? Why are you acting like this? Yeah, are are you this or that? And I, it, it's not in the way that's oh, is he this or that? No, it's like, are, come on, are you this or that? Give me, give me a clear. It's true. Give me some sort of clarity here or some sort of thing to hook onto before you start throwing curveballs, right? Uh, so that would have been higher, but anyway, uh, number three, my, for my number three pick, I had The Big Sick, which is nice. the complete antithesis to, antithesis to Atomic Blunt, and I gave it marks for its very original story. At least I thought it was an original story. I, I enjoy rom-coms and its diversity in terms of in, including the Pakistani culture in there, which we don't see a lot of. A lot of people th- Not think- Not at all. Yeah, a lot of people think Kam- Kamal Nanjiani. Kamal Nanjiani. Kamal Nanjiani. A lot of people think he's Indian, which is insulting because he's actually Pakistani and they are two complete, don't, don't, don't get it mixed up. If you want to piss off an Indi- Indian person, don't call him Pakistani and vice versa. That's exactly. Uh, and it, But it really, it, the plot and the way they handled it, because it was written by uh, Nanjiani and his wife and his, and his, and wife, his wife, correct? Emily who, V. Gordon, who is played by someone else in this movie, uh, right? Zoe Kazan, exactly. Zoe Kazan from Ruby Sparks, mm-hmm. and it captures that immigrant yeah. feeling. As someone who was the first generation son of, of Filipino immigrants, it it really hit that. home with me. I so not, I, I did not know that. Yes, exactly. Uh, but I, I, I for in sort of a biased way, I have I had kind of had a close attachment to this movie because it, it captured that really well and kind of like that break away from. Oh, am I American? Am I Pakistani? How does love work in that in that context in that environment? And the cast here is fantastic. There is no single weak spot. Non, and uh, uh, shout outs to Nanjiani and Ray Romano, who I think kind of makes a triumphant return to media. I don't know what he's been doing lately. Yeah, neither do I. Yeah, but uh, th- those two were standout performances. And Holly Hunter too. She was great. I didn't know Holly Hunter and Ray Romano had to be a thing. Like in 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 screen before this movie, like oh wow, this dynamic works really well in terms of that couple. <laughs> and uh, the only mark I can give it is that its comedy isn't consistent. Its tone, it has some tonal shifts in the third and uh, in the second and third act that I think aren't as smooth. I think that didn't match up to the like the the first act is like captures the magic of the relationship between Nanjiani and um, uh, I'm sorry, what's her name? Zoe Zoe Kazan Kazan Kazan. But that captures the magic between uh, Nanjiani and Kazan, but then it never really captures that again. And I get that that's kind of the point because Kazan is removed from the film entirely and it kind of makes it an original story. But I don't know, the tonal shifts were too great for me to make it you know, my number one, honestly. But uh, that's really the only mark I can give it. it. It was a refreshing movie and I had a great time. That's all. That's really all you can ask for something like yeah, that. That was such sure. a low key surprise. Uh, and also, too, just to add the one last thing with the big sick, it's made over forty million dollars domestically, which that's, is great. Uh, off which a is, budget of off a budget of. I don't think they released the figures. The budget, I don't think, has been released. But, but it couldn't have been that high. No, it, it's a I would say comedy. maybe maybe five, ten million. Yeah. I'm guessing. That's great. I, I hope that gives it more support because any any you movie that that smartly, like not forced, that smartly introduces diversity. Um, into the American mainstream, I think I think is a is a hit. So, oh yeah, is a win. I I, me, I so. could I could not agree. I could hardly agree more. 
My number four film of the summer is Spider-Man Homecoming. Really? Indeed, indeed. I liked this film quite a bit. We talked extensively about it on air uh, shortly after its opening week. Uh, as somebody who was moot on The Amazing Spider-Man and The Amazing Spider-Man 2, I did not load The Amazing Spider-Man 2 like a lot of people did. I kind of reviewed these movies indifferently. Like I basically said my reviews, going back and reading them a few days ago, of my, my, my reviews basically boiled down to like... They're not the Sam Raimi movies. They're okay, I guess. That's mm. kind of my was my attitude towards that. I thought Mark Webb was an interesting director for those two. This is the Amazing Spider-Man series with um, Andrew Garfield. I thought Webb was an interesting director for those movies. But I didn't really see this spark. And with Spider-Man Homecoming, I got it in mass. This is a smartly written film by the writing team of Jonathan Goldstein, John Francis Daly, director John Watts, and several other people. This is written by about five or six different people mm -hmm. um all boiled together in to make a great teen movie and an even better superhero movie there's a lot of great zeal in this movie that's very i would say effervescent very light it's not really too heavy in its tone it doesn't much show the agony of spider-man like you're thinking maybe spider-man 2 did but it definitely shows the difficulties and this was a problem that i and i speaking as somebody who loves the sam raimi films one and two in particular and somebody who loves those movies. The thing that the Sam Raimi movies did not show, and The Amazing Spider-Man really didn't show it either, was the struggle to be Spider-Man physically, was getting the web shooting right. All of a sudden, they, Tobey Maguire and Andrew Garfield, both of them, they could suit up and be Spider-Man and have no problem swinging from building to building. Tom Holland, who plays Peter Parker in the film Spider-Man, he fumbles more than he lands his 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 um you know webs acrobatics, and, acrobatics and, yeah. and stuff like that. You know, it's it's not something that 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 is nailed right on. And maybe you could say that's a small detail. Yeah, but it's an important detail. It's a realistic detail. It, 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 there's a there's a moment in this movie where I, actually it did something I've always wondered for years. What if Spider-Man, while swinging, just smacks into something and he just gets a concussion? It's and true. that's what happens. At the, I mean, that's not really a spoiler, but um, that, that, that's what happens. He he hits the ceiling of something while web slinging and just knocks out. It's like, hey, he's just he doesn't know what he's doing. He's a, a kid. Absolutely. And then there's some great scenes that like almost inspire Vertigo. Like I love the scene. It actually serves. If we were going by like favorite movie mm -hmm. sequences. I'm sure you'd probably put if we were going by scenes and sequences. I'm sure you'd put that staircase scene from Atomic Blonde on the list. Oh, yeah, absolutely. That, yeah. I, I forgot <laughs> to mention that actually. That long shot scene of Atomic Blonde was so well done, not to deviate, but uh, it was so well done. Was. That's, that's what really put the fighting o on over the top for me in terms of that rating. Oh, I'm sure. So good. Now, what I was saying with Spider-Man Homecoming, my number four pick for top five of the summer, is that that scene in the Washington Monument when he's climbing the monument. I'm, su is, is, I'm is, surprised is, you like that. Is, is, is incredible. I, I loved it. And I, and I normally don't go for something like that. The last time I kind of had, and I saw this, and keep in mind, I did see this in 3D because of the times, the way they worked out. I did see it in 3D. It was intensified a little bit. The last time I could remember being in a theater and being like that kind of, not even claustrophobic, but like that uncomfortable was the Joseph Gordon-Levitt movie, The Walk, which nobody saw in theaters. That was the I one about that, that was the one about the about the gentleman I can't remember his name the French man that walked that t tied a tether between the two twin towers and walked oh across. no 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 I do know okay no, I knew what that was about. that and th those are some great scenes but that really reminded me I love Spider-Man Homecoming I loved its light tone it's one of my favorite superhero movies of 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 the last decade and I and I really truly got behind this movie in a lot of different ways not a perfect film not and not a really like game changing film but for for a Spider-Man movie, especially the Spider-Man fatigue, we talk about you talk about superhero fatigue a lot. For the Spider-Man fatigue that we've experienced, getting something like Homecoming is is a really great treat. I loved it. It's one of the few movies. The reason why I liked it so much, it, it doesn't make an appearance on my list, but I, I really liked it too, is because it it portrayed teens like the perfect way, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. I thought, okay, they're not adults playing teens and it, it feels weird almost to the point where it's a joke like 21 jump street you're, you know you got Channing yes, Tatum playing a teenager but um but that that's intentional and the, but then it doesn't go the other way where it's like they're just kids or like they're like infants you know they're just kind of whiny and whatever not that that isn't how teenagers are but still it presents it in a way that's enjoyable um they actually have i think i think teenage Kids in the, or uh, teenage kids. Yeah, playing this, playing I was gonna say not movie? not much older than us. Not if anything, yeah. not much older than us. Okay. Anyway, the, either Holland's either way, still young. Holland's yeah. still very young. Either way, it's the, they they are portrayed like teenagers, and it's I think one of the best portrayals of teenagers in film. 
That's actually too bold of a statement. I was going to say it was one of the best since, you know, like the 80s, how they, uh, was it, the Brat Pack? Yeah, the Brat Pack, Breakfast yeah. Club. I, I, stuff, I, should, I should not, yeah, I should not say it's better than that, or since then, that's one of the... But it's good of, for now, because we, we don't get it a lot. Yeah, it, it portrays it smartly, that, yes. I like that. Now, my number three pick is going to be going, is going to go down as one of the biggest box office bombs of the year, unfortunately. It is Catherine Bigelow's Detroit. We talked a lot about this on the show, got into some very touchy political commentary, which I always welcome if a film allows it, and this one certainly did, not to go too much into it again, but it tells the story of the Algiers Motel incident during the 1967 12th Street riot in Detroit, Michigan. This film is an ensemble cast of everybody from John Boyega from Star Wars, Will Poulter from Where the Millers, who should get an Oscar nomination here, probably won't, but should. Algie Smith, a new coming actor who's great in this film, in addition to Jason Mitchell from Straight Outta Compton. It's a movie that largely takes place uh, during a police raid on the Algiers Motel incident after allegedly somebody fired a starter pistol out the window amidst the rebellion. After apprehend several African-American gentlemen and two Caucasian women. Uh, the police apprehend these individuals, put them against a wall, and basically try to make them turn on each other through intense tactics of police brutality. Now, this is a movie that really should said before be a time capsule this is a movie that we should look at similar to lincoln similar to 12 years a slave a movie where we look at it and be like you know that was bad thank god it doesn't happen now but it's not in fact this movie might even indeed be more timely now than it was when the 12th street riot actually did take place the movie was released uh within it's on it's on around the 50th anniversary of that and the fact that this movie bombed i don't think it's more of a more of a of a difficulty with the lack of interest Catherine bigelow obviously famous for the hurt locker uh famous for zero dark 30 i don't think it's a lack of interest in this movie i don't think there's people that like looked at it and said i don't want to see it i think it came out at a terrible time it came out in, in early August, which is not a time that's friendly to these dramas. Two months later in October, this would have been a very decent medium-sized hit. I can only hope that this movie gets some Oscar nominations in the realm of either Best Original Screenplay, uh, Best Director Catherine Bigelow, or at least, at very least, Will Poulter, who gives an amazing performance as a police officer, Caucasian police officer. I can only hope it gets some Oscar nods, because without that, I fear that this movie's going to be lost, which is too bad. Mm -hmm. You know? I I, I I don't have anything to argue that at all. I'm actually going to just go ahead and spoil my number two, which was also Detroit. Detroit. And uh, the thing that I loved about this was that it was a visceral I, I, visceral civil rights movie that you can compare, con, you can contrast, compare and contrast with Hidden Figures, which came out. This, we, we, we did, and we did. Last year? It, it, came, came, out last it came out earlier this year. Yeah, and that was, that's, I think Hidden Figures was January. the last civil rights movie I had seen, you know, anything pertaining to race and civil rights like that. And, like it just it hit me so hard and it, it came as such a surprise coming especially coming out of hidden figures that it 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 hit me right in the gut and uh, yeah. i I don't even know if enjoy is the right word, but more so, no. I feel like I was, I this was is affected. A, and make no quibbles, too. I mean, because we did talk about Hidden Figures and how I said our audiences would um, mm -hmm. somewhat understandably rather pay for Hidden Figures than see Detroit. Right. No, I get it. We like Hidden Figures. Um, but the thing is, too, is I, I, I got to stress, too, this is not an easy set. No. And I mean, and, and this is coming and this is coming from a white guy right here. I mean, <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, seriously, I mean, I mean, I, I can't imagine the way, you know, the African-American community might respond to this movie or has responded to this movie, because this this is a tough sit. This is not the kind of thing people want to go to the theater and watch, mm -hmm. especially people that have lived this and people that have experienced either brutality or have experienced racial profiling. This is not the kind of movie that people want to see. And that's the difficulty with it. But it is a necessary watch, more so for the people that don't watch this movie, that don't watch this type of film. I'm, I'm going to steal a line from Easy e in this movie. That's kind of a joke because he, I, I forgot his name. Jason Mitchell. Jason Mitchell. Easy e is not in this movie. But... Um, <laughs> He he has a line that is akin to "This is what it's like to be black in America." Yes, it's like this is what it feels like. This gun on you all the time. That's what it like to be black in America. And that that hit me like right between the eyes. To steal a line from John Coltrane. It's like, oh wow, holy, yeah, holy geez. <laughs> and um, for for that reason, and on top of that, Will Poulter. It's kind of ironic that the standout performance here is from a white guy. But uh, seriously, Will Poulter, he he captures. Uh, a, uh, an authority figure drunk with power so freaking well in this movie that yeah. that that performance like the fact that he is not affected at all like in the first act of the movie he um he nicks a, a, a runner uh, with a with a shotgun mm -hmm. 
And when they later really, like when like uh, a superior is confronting him about this, he is not affected at all. Like he's completely right. Like yeah, I shot him. Mm-hmm. Whatever he was, he was running. Uh, that's whatever. Makes no attempt to conceal it or anything like yeah. that. Yeah, and he's just not yeah. affected. But at the same time, you just see the sliminess come out of Will Poulter, which doesn't help that Will Poulter just kind of has a slimy looking face to begin with. I'm he's got sorry. like a he's got like a kind of a persickety smugness. Yeah, to it, him. it sucks that he's kind of he just looks that way. <laughs> You know, initially, I'm sure he's a great guy. If there's any sports fans or like football fans or bear fans, he's got a real Jimmy Clausen kind of look to him. You know, he's got a real Jimmy Clausen kind of face. You know what I mean? I some people, some people might know what I'm talking about. I think he's been playing these roles since like he was a kid. Oh yeah, since he was young, and he's a new actor. He's only been acting for this decade. Not, I knocked it tried a little bit because it it was unable to match the third act to the heart pounding. Holy crap, visceral second act. Yes, because the movie is 143 minutes and about 80 take place in that Algiers motel. I would say yeah. about 80, 85 minutes of it take place in the Algiers motel. I know what you're talking about with the third act. It gets a little bit courtroom drama, but still, I, I, I think this is this was a movie that really kind of had to operate on a large landscape, a large yes, playing absolutely. field. So I think it did need to include that, but we will be show. back to give So, top five films of the summer. I'm going to my number two pick. It has already been mentioned. The Big Sick. Love this movie. Uh, I'll be damned if it's not my favorite comedy of the year. Uh, it doesn't look like we're going to be too heavy in comedy the next couple of months, so it very well could wind up being my top, my favorite comedy of the year. Directed by Michael Showalter, who directed Wet Hot American Summer, starring, as mentioned, Kamal Nanjiani and Zoe Kazan. The film tells the true story of Kumal Nanjiani, a young Chicago stand-up comedian who drives Uber and performs at a lot of nightclubs in hopes that he can make it on Second City or Saturday Night Live one day, hopefully get some mainstream recognition, his world kind of gets sent into a tailspin when a woman that he is loosely seeing, uh, his girl named Emily, uh, he basically, uh, he's going, he's seeing her and whatnot, and then she winds up going and getting very sick. He has to put her in a medically induced coma. So the film largely revolves around him getting to know her parents, played by Holly Hunter and Ray Romano, and forming a relationship between them while his girlfriend is incapacitated in a hospital bed. Uh, I know it sounds dark, and it does get a little bit dark at times, but this is an extreme extremely funny movie and it's a very well i think it's a very well made movie i think the tone i know you had a couple issues with the tone dominic i know you had a few issues with the tone i think the tone in this movie is mostly consistent i see at the end how it gets a little blocky towards the conclusion but i still think it's not really enough to deteriorate this film or to send it on a bad course i think that kamal nanjiani is an effortlessly likable screen presence who finally gets a movie that he can kind of be himself in he's done a lot of like legwork recently on really kind of crappy movies like Addicted to Fresno, like Sex Tape, like Central Intelligence, where he's kind of just been not phoning it in, but he's kind of just doing these movies you could tell to like kind of get a supporting name for himself. Here he takes the lead. It's a true story. He plays himself. He sinks in very well. He's got It's got a good kind of commentary about um, the American dream in terms and in, in from the perspective of an immigrant like you mentioned. A uh, very good kind of Pakistani Muslim uh, look into the life of a Pakistani Muslim. And again, it is very, very well written, written by Kamal Nanjiani and his wife, Emily V. Gordon, who I said before is played by Zoe Kazan in the film. Love the big sick. My number two pick for favorite film of the summer. It's it's a real passion project, and it really shows, especially compared to his uh, you know other supporting roles. Um, I will say, I should, I should correct myself a little bit. It's not so much the tonal shifts, because, you know, it has to follow that, you know, large arc of, oh, here's drama, tension, whatever. But it, I think it was more so the pacing of the movie that wasn't as consistent as it was in the first act. Something about, I can't even pinpoint, it had to be so precise, which is, I mean, it's already my top three, so it's still, you know, really good, don't get me wrong. Indeed. But, I don't know, something, maybe it was the pacing in terms of how they handled after, after the events the fa- of the, after after the, the fact, second act? After the fact, yeah. yeah I, I don't know. I don't know how to... I really do not know how to describe it. I'd have to analyze it, I guess. But still, I, I enjoyed it. Yeah, I'm glad, I'm glad you did. I'm glad we got to see it and talk about it. Because I remember it was a busy weekend, the weekend we saw yeah. it. So I remember we had to talk about it during the 1 o'clock hour. I had to go into that kind of business. So it was a little bit tough. But I'm glad we did get to make time mm-hmm. for a really, really good film. So on with you, Dominic. Your number one film of the summer. I'm doing a dramatic pause so I can edit in music later. But (laughs) number one pick for summer of 2017, Dunkirk. Surprise! Alarms. uh, Air raid sirens. There you go. But, um, yeah. I mean, look. uh, Christopher Nolan, 
is just a fantastic director, and I know there's a lot of people who are immediately going to bounce off. I feel like Dunkirk should be a lot of people's number ones, but they're not going to put Dunkirk at number one because they're going to try and be edgy and different. But honestly, look, when you have a good movie in front of you, it's just freaking good. It's it's right there. And um, Christopher Nolan, he's I'm not even that much of a diehard Christopher Nolan fanboy, honestly. I just think he makes really good movies that are different. And stylistically distinct from everything else that's coming out, and I, I think it merits it. But yeah, Dunkirk as, as itself as a film is extremely hyper focused on the drama of being in that incredible historic situation that happened um, in northern France, and because it is so hyper focused, it allows a deeper exploration into the craft of film. And that's what I like about it. That's why I have it as my number one, and that's why I like Christopher Nolan, why I have much more respect for Christopher Nolan now. Because if you think about it, World War II is such an overwrought thing. I mean, I know that sounds kind of bad, because, you know, it's World War II. You should honor your veterans, of course, and never forget the sacrifices made. But in terms of medium, in terms of movies and video games, and tele, uh, I think even television to an extent, it's, it's kind of been overdone. Like, how many Medal of Honor and Call of Duties are set in World War II how many movies have we seen in World War II? And I, I get it's a big historical thing. That there has to be a lot to come out of it. But it's very distinct even as a World War II movie, particularly because of its use of sound. Its use of sound was so incredible. It also helped that we both saw it in theaters that were, we saw it separately, but in theaters that were really meant for, that are really accentuated um, sound. And I did shell out for IMAX for it. Ex exactly. I, 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 I use like the Regal Cinema's RPX thing. I don't. I have no idea what that's about, but uh, I paid more for it, so I guess I'm, I'm using that as an excuse. But yeah, the, especially the the dive bombers, I think the Stuka dive bombers, or maybe Henkels, when they come in for their big runs, that is that is such a tr for the soldiers. They are a traumatic thing, of course. And as a movie goer, as someone who watched this movie, that is. A memorable thing. That is a sound that will stick with me for a long, long oh, yeah. time. That is one of that's up like up there with. I compared it to the sound of the tripods in Steven Spielberg's War of the Worlds, uh, or you know, what are other distinct sounds in in movies that no one will ever forget? Uh, I can't I can't think of anything. Psycho. Right now. I was gonna say sure, Alfred, sure. Alfred Hitchcock yeah. film. There's a lot. There's quite there's quite a few. Yeah, exactly. But th that'll just stick with a couple me. Kubrick movies. And too. Another thing I didn't mention in the review. Another thing that I really appreciated about this movie is that it's PG-13. It it doesn't need an R rating. No. It, and it doesn't and it doesn't need two and a half hours. And exactly. It doesn't need two and a half hours. And it's, 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 a, it's, it's a fairly quick movie. It's, too. A, it's about a hundred. It's about a hundred and six minutes. I think if I remember correctly. It captures it's, that it's quick. Exactly. It captures that feeling of an epic. In a sh relatively short amount of time, and you know, in a post-Tarantino world where everything has to be three hours and bl blood spilling literally everywhere, I feel like vulgarity. Exactly. Yeah. Which I uh, yeah, don't get me wrong, I love that, but the fact that uh, Nolan can rein everything in and still give out something that affects so much without having to—I'm not going to say stoop low because I. I think there's an art to blood splatter and an art to swearing as well. But the fact that he doesn't need to uh, ex go there while exploring other things. Again, exploring uh, more into film as a craft is what really makes Dunkirk an easy, easy number one. I love Detroit, which was my number two, but number Dunkirk was just leaps and bounds in terms of everything else, at least coming out this year and coming out in in the past couple years, I think. Yeah. Yeah. All right. That's good, man. That's a good. That's a good choice. That's a good choice. I was waiting for that one to kind of eke on there. And I thought <laughs> yeah. maybe, maybe. My number one pick. I know you didn't see it. Uh, this is a, this is one that I don't think a lot of people have seen, and this is one that I want you to watch. It's coming out. I want you okay. to listen to watch. And Dominic, I want you to watch. It's coming out the DVD next month, October seventeenth, if I'm not mistaken. The movie is David Lowry's A Ghost Story. Love this movie dearly, and this one was one that did not get a lot of press. Stars Casey Affleck and Rooney Mara. Some people might know it as the reason why Casey Affleck came with a grizzly came to the Oscars with a grizzly Adams beard uh, because he was filming this movie. Now David Lowry, a little bit of backstory on David Lowry, the director of A Ghost Story. Uh, he directed Pete's Dragon last year. Mm -hmm. You saw that. That was the Disney movie. That movie was seventy cost seventy million dollars to make. A ghost story, by comparison, cost $100,000 to make. And it was a very 
difficult mood piece. And I said, if you're not careful and you go into this movie with a patient and open mind, you might emerge more introspective and aware of your own feelings and your place in the world. The film is very difficult to explain, but it revolves around Casey Affleck and Rooney Mara as a couple. You don't know if they're married. You think they're dating. You're not really sure. He's a struggling indie musician. Uh, she often feels kind of handcuffed to his uh, passion, but also his indecision. So then we see the aftermath of uh, basically a car accident that renders Casey Affleck's character dead. Affleck and Mara do not have names in this movie. There's very, very little dialogue in this movie. Uh, so what happens then is her husband or boyfriend, Casey Affleck, reemerges as a ghost in the crudest, most kindergarten sense. I showed Dominic a picture in the studio right now. It's great that's for the, our, our, uh, it, our, our viewing audience. Our, our radio listeners. That's that's our that's the ghost. It's hey, a bed sheet that, with two eye holes cut. That's that's pretty creepy. Don't get me wrong. like that. That's I, with the gray I scale. This. With the gray I, yeah. scale. I appreciate this. So it, 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 this is a horror movie. It, it, it is not. It is. Oh, okay. It's got horror elements, but it is not a horror movie. It's more of a drama. It's also another thing that I love about movies, and this is almost certainly going to be my top, one of my top three film, favorite films of the year. Uh, the thing I love about this movie is that it's hard to classify. It's a me. It's a meditation on almost anything you really want it to be: life, death, ego, legacy, grief, greed, purpose. Uh, very similar to. Uh, Terrence Malick's Tree of Life, Richard Linklater's Boyhood, in this sense, uh, really just concerns because he comes back, like I said, Casey Affleck dies and then comes back as that ghost, this kindergarten kind of style ghost with a bed sheet and two eye holes cut, and it basically shows this ghost kind of go through time. The ghost kind of stands idly by watching Rooney Mara kind of sulk and cry and kind of stress eat, but then it goes on to like uh, live in the house when a Spanish-speaking family moves into it, and then it goes goes on and the ghost completely remains passive to ever, any event that happens around it goes on to even see the house become be de, that they lived in demolished and such mm -hmm. and that's really what what the film revolves around it actually has an interesting cameo of appearance uh it's actually got a very a very quick blink and you miss it you won't you wouldn't even know if i didn't mention it who makes a brief appearance as one line of dialogue is actually pop singer kesha She's in it oh. very briefly, okay. very, very briefly. But this is an extraordinary movie, a movie that people really need to be patient with. It's not long. It's only about 90 minutes, 88 without credits. It's very short. It's shot also in 4-3. I'll just mention this really quickly. It's shot in 4-3 aspect ratio, which means that the left and right sides are taken over by black bars, and the corners of the movie are kind of rounded out, the four corners oh. are rounded out, kind of like a – imagine a Polaroid. Kind of like a Polaroid, like you're watching a home movie, like a super 16 millimeter mm -hmm. home movie. This film's got very interesting cinematography, a great loose narrative. I'm not always all in on movies like this that are uh, very ambiguous for the sake of being ambiguous. But this is definitely one that I really appreciated, really loved. Four Stars, A Ghost Story, my favorite film of the summer. I, I should say, I, I can't really say anything much here because I didn't see it, but... Um, so you're saying the, the ghost was passive throughout the movie. It doesn't participate much at all. It just kind of stands there. It, just, it really just stands there, kind of moves fluidly with the, um, with, with whatever's going on. Nobody else sees it. A couple times does the ghost, like, make plates break or make the lights flicker, but it never really interferes fears totally. There's one scene of, like, total chaos, but there's not much. You're mainly watching this bed sheet of a ghost kind of meander through this general area of of this like one story home. That's pretty creepy. And, yeah, and it, and it's very effective. It's a very effective mood movie too. I really appreciate that because I feel like I've all I've seen of I'm not a big horror movie person. I kind of hate horror movies because I, I don't know. I'm kind of a wimp like that. But um, yeah, Chelsea informed me we're not see, you're not we're not talking it this week. On oh, the show, absolutely apparently. not. That's all you. You take that show. I, yeah, I was gonna say I know you're not gonna be available, but I mean you're not. <laughs> even if you were, we're not talking about it. Uh, -uh. No, <laughs> no, I'm not. But I, I saw the it trailer. I'm, I'm going to tie this to Ghost Story, but I saw the It trailer. That trailer has, like, five jump scares in, like, 40 seconds. It's a, it's a record breaker. And it, that, um, I hate that. That annoys me so much. And that's a long trailer. That's like a three-minute trailer, that It. You know what I mean? I, you got to watch the kids oh. and stuff like that, and then, you see, and then you see all the clown memorabilia, all that crap. You know what I mean? I appreciate a film. And maybe that was just a trailer. Again, I haven't seen the actual It film. But I, I appreciate movies that actually take their time and let... Horror and creepiness and uneasiness settle in when when you're watching it. From what few I have seen the the, the American version of The Ring, mm -hmm. um, and I'm failing to remember some other 
other horror stories. But I feel like the jump scares there were were not as much, and uh, that gave me more that gave me more room to be scared as opposed to shocked. And what was, there was a trailer for a movie. I feel like either this year or last year there was a trailer for a movie, a horror movie, where it's just it starts off going down a hallway for thirty seconds. You know what I'm talking about? Did you see that trailer? Maybe vaguely. Maybe vaguely. I see a lot of trailers, and I've been trying to start avoiding. I them. feel like there were no, there, there was no talk about this movie at all. But it, it, the trailer was, it was just it going. Maybe it down. comes at night. I think it, it might be it comes at night. It was just the trailer just had it going down the hallway for 30 seconds, and it's just like, what is going on? What is going to happen at the end of this hallway? And it's classic, you know, Hitchcock level suspense, and it got me. And that's what I, that's what I enjoy in, in terms of a horror movie. Yes, I mean I love the ghost story. See it if you can. It comes to DVD. I know not many people saw it in theaters. Not many people got to see it in theaters. No. I was one of the fortunate out of the five theaters around me that I frequent. Only one had it. Um, so I, I liked it a lot. It came out in July. It's coming to DVD October seventeenth. Definitely make time for that. That's our top five. If I want to give an honorable mention and just say a sentence about it, I kind of already did. Uh, the Joel Edgerton horror drama movie. It comes at night that's probably my honorable mention okay. i like that movie a lot very moody similar to a ghost story not always a horror movie though more of a drama and like audiences really did not catch on with this movie at all that it comes at night it really did not get the love it really deserved a lot of people were going into it because it was marketed kind of more of a horror movie but it was very it was again like a ghost story it was very meditative it was very contemplative on the because it took place all in this like ramshackle house after this on un, un, this vague virus broke out. That and I think that's the trailer I saw. I wouldn't doubt it. I mean, it's a it's a great film. Definitely check it out. But don't go into it expecting a horror movie. The only thing I can say really that like people have seemed to connect to the ones that have seen it and liked it or you know thought it was decent is that it's kind of like if a novel, if you were to film a novel, mm -hmm. that's kind of how this movie operates. And some will know what I'm talking about. It's kind of like that. It's kind of like a novel if you would adapt it, even though it's not based on anything. It kind of reminds me of like an, an old school, very picturesque Victorian novel. The kind that like take five six minutes to describe yeah. a, to describe the way a light reflects off the ceiling that kind of a story but it's only ninety minutes very good movie Dominic what's your honorable mention really my quick? honorable mention uh, well, actually you, you, I didn't really think of one at first but you told me during yeah told me to think of one during the break and I'm gonna give it to Baby Driver yeah uh, number six good uh, choice a very close number six uh, fairly interchangeable with uh, Logan Lucky which is my number five uh, I I think Logan Lucky was just I think maybe I think I have a bias here because it's again it's recent it's fresh and I. Uh, I just I was surprised by how lackadaisical and fun it was, but uh, yeah, Baby Driver uh, I felt was yeah it, it's it's Edgar Wright's I think mainstream crossover appeal, and I I'm not bashing that at all. Not I mean, at all, no. I think I think this is one of the most Edgar Wright movies we've ever had, you know, of 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 his style because it again the power of that movie comes through its. Distinct editing, it's repetitive editing to the point, and I mean that in a way that it pulls the same trick over and over again throughout the entire film, and I have no problem with that because that is something that I feel like hasn't been done much. I'm not, I, I'm not well versed in the history of cinema, but I feel like that is something that is so obvious and so awesome that you know he pulls it up beautifully, and it's it's, it's right there, I, and I it do, works. Yeah, I do knock it off. I do knock it, I should say, for a little bit because there's some unnecessary meat that we didn't need or how should I, I don't know, what's the metaphor there but uh, some excess except there you go excess that we could have cut away and not as tight as it could have been like say Dunkirk but yeah Wasn't Baby Driver name, yeah yeah, Baby Driver easily um, a great movie for Edgar Wright and yeah indeed there's a ton of good movies to check out this was a very good summer